So my ANDI scores stand for Aggregate Nutrient Density Index, which we add up those 36 different nutrients that the government keeps a record of in each particular food to give people a tool so they can easily recognize the foods with the highest nutrient density. And this is just a tool. It's not all you need to know about nutrition. It's just a tool to direct shoppers and direct people making food choices to eat more healthy food. And it worked. They use this in Whole Foods Market in the produce section, and it directs people, and since they've been using it in Whole Foods Market, their produce sales went up dramatically, and in particular, their sale of green vegetables like kale went up like a thousandfold. A th not a thousandfold, a thousand percent. That's tenfold, a thousand percent, right? So it's working. It's directing shoppers to make better food choices. And because you can see that the dark green vegetables aren't just twice as nutrient rich as chicken and white bread. They're f not even 10 times as nutrient rich. They're 50 times more nutrient rich. Did you follow that? Out of blueberries We'll get to your questions later, if I have time at the movie, I finish, OK? Blueberries are very, very high in nutrients. They're, all berries are particularly similar. But I just want to say that the nutrient density scores isn't all you need to know to pick the right foods to eat because there are some foods that have salient features that make them particularly powerful against cancer, yet they don't have a high ANDI score. So it wouldn't matter if a, if a blueberry wouldn't have a high ANDI score because a blueberry has salient features, like, for example, very high in polyphenols that are very powerful anti-cancer effects. If a mushroom isn't that high in the ANDI scoring system, it means they don't contain all those high levels of the 36 different nutrients, but mushrooms contain aromatase inhibitors and angiogenesis inhibitors and antigen binding lectins. In other words, mushrooms have particular nutrients that are very powerfully protective against cancer. Aromatase inhibitors prevent the breast from being stimulated from estrogen and the prostate from being stimulated from testosterone. They protect against cancer, and they're angiogenesis inhibitors. The word angiogenesis means, means that um, the growth of new blood vessels. They prevent new blood vessels from fueling the growth of fat on the body, and they prevent the new growth of blood vessels from fueling the growth of cancer cells on the body. They say, no way, Jose, I'm not letting you put fat on my, your body. I'm not letting cancer grow on your body. But they wouldn't score that high in the anti-scoring system because those, the anti-scoring system isn't measuring aromatase inhibition. Did you follow that? So I just don't want you to think this is everything. It's just part of the whole, it's just one of the many tools you need to know. Now, another important tool and another important point of a nutritarian diet, the second principle, is that it has to be hormonally favorable. It can't drive up hormones like estrogen, insulin, IGF-1, and that in high levels would promote cancer. Now, one way, is, one way in which processed foods and unhealthy eating promotes fat storage hormones has to do with how fast the food is digested, how fast those calories enter the bloodstream. So I call it fast food versus slow food. In other words, fast food is not merely the food you eat at a fast food restaurant, though those foods are linked to earlier death and depression as well. But depression is also linked in a dose-dependent manner to the amount of servings of commercial baked goods a week a person eats. As they eat more commercial baked goods, depression goes up accordingly. So I'm saying here that I'm calling fast food foods that's absorbed, whose calories are absorbed rapidly, who are cal whose calories are calorically concentrated, because those rapid caloric concentrations set up dopamine receptors in the brain, making people addicted to overeating and to eating calorically concentrated food. And the rush of calories into the bloodstream so rapidly revs up the fat storage hormones like insulin, which prevents fat loss and makes you and has anti-angiogenesis effects, which means they stop, they promote the growth of fat, whereas the mushrooms and the onions would say, no, I don't want you to put the fat on your body, right? So the number, so the the um, hormone we're talking about here is insulin. When you eat foods that have a high glycemic load, which means those calories into the bloodstream in that first hour after eating, right, with a load from those high glycemic carbohydrates, the glycemic index of that food and the glycemic load of that amount of food you ate is, has to do with how rapidly those um, carbohydrate calories were absorbed and converted into glucose. So, so take an example of, give me an example of a food that has a high glycemic load that, that a lot of glucose enters the bloodstream very rapidly when you eat that food. Can anybody over here? What's that? No, not a banana. A cookie, yes, right? 
you know, a fruit would have a low glycemic load, like a banana, because it's associated with fibers and polyphenols that block the rapid absorption, whereas a cookie with white flour and sugar would. Keep in mind that white flour products enter the bloodstream almost as quickly as had you had it in a cube of sugar. Maybe it's, you know, five minutes versus eight minutes, so a little bit, but it's the same thing. In other words, the glycemic load of white flour is almost the same as sugar. When you have that bagel, when you have that cookie, when you have that piece of cake, you might as well just be, eating, be chewing on a sugar cube because the effect on the body is biologically almost the same. And that revs up insulin, and insulin is a cancer-promoting hormone which also promotes atherosclerosis and dementia of the brain and depression. So an example of fast foods might be oil and white flour products, right? And an example of slow foods might be something like beans and nuts. Now you can see oil, compare oil to nuts, most might be from the same food, but have different biological effects. Whereas the oil might brush into your bloodstream very rapidly, the nut or seed may take four or five hours for those same fats to enter the bloodstream. Let me give you an example. If you consumed walnut oil, let's say, compared to you guys were consuming walnuts, right? So you consume the walnut oil, and, they, and the, those fat calories entered the bloodstream within five to 10 minutes. Yes, it entered your mouth, it got chewed, it went to the digestive tract, and it entered the bloodstream within five or 10 minutes. And the bloodstream can't tolerate the rush of fat in, in, in the blood, so it rapidly stores that as fat instantaneously. It's stored as fat and put in your fat cells within another five or 10 minutes. That means within 15 minutes, from your lips to your hips, boom, it's stored as fat. You're not breaking down fat as you're storing fat. You're storing fat. Revving up fat storage hormones. Now, when you had the walnuts, the sterols, the stanols, the fibers in those walnuts allowed you to absorb those calories over a three to four hour period. It gradually absorbed them little by little, a certain amount of calories per hour over many hours. So your body doesn't rev up fat storage, it doesn't store it as fat, it burns it for energy. Also, those sterols and sterols, sterols and stanols and fibers hold on to fat. And it holds on to fat in the digestive tract, so it increases stool fat, the fat that goes out of the toilet bowl. So all the calories from the walnut are not biologically accessible to the body, because some of those calories are lost when it passes right through you. Did you follow that? Whereas the calories from the walnut oil was 100% absorbable. Now, the excess stool fat that came into a play here because you had the walnuts is not the fat that was in the walnuts because there's an enterohepatic circulation between the digestive tract and the liver and the bloodstream where fats go into the digestive tract and, back into the, and then back out again and those fibers in the walnut holds on to saturated fat and cholesterol and increases the stool L cholesterol and the stool saturated fats allowing the better fats to come in and the worse fats to come out. Did you follow that? Kind of like an ion exchange sponge mechanism, sponging up the fats, the bad fats, and taking them out of your body so the wall not have the effect to lower the cholesterol and to induce fat loss, to lower the glycemic effect, lower the level of insulin, and promote fat loss in the body where the walnut oil had the opposite effect. So I'm gonna give you, so it's, it's the same basic food, right? But one's processed and one's natural. One's a whole natural food and one's a processed food. So sesame seed oil is not the same thing as sesame seeds. So I'll hold up the food and you tell me whether it's going to induce fat storage in the body or it's going to induce fat loss to the body. You ready? Let's try this right now. Almond oil. Gain weight, fat, right? Right. Almonds. Lose weight, right, you got it. That's it. Flaxseed oil. Not good food. Flax seeds. So yeah, you lose what a superfood with all the lignans and fibers that prevent cancer. Exactly. Okay. Motor oil. Oh. Hardly ever eat that stuff. <laughs> so here's what I'm saying, that when we process and refine a food, especially when we process and refine a carbohydrate, we make the calories more accessible more quickly. And that's particularly dangerous. And I'm saying here that the high glycemic carbohydrates, like sugar and white flour, are linked to cancer breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer. They're not just cause diabetes, they don't just cause you to gain weight and be sickly and develop heart disease, and they don't just cause dementia and depression, they also cause cancer. So when you eat that bagel, you're eating a cancer-promoting food, a carcinogenic food. Is that a bagel in front of you right there? No, no. <laughs> a bagel that was grown from a tree. So some high glycemic load foods might be white rice and white potato and white pasta, chocolate cake. Guys, I always say, you hear me say, the whiter the bread, the sooner you're dead, right? Remember that one? 
And the more you eat green, the more you get lean. Right? And I always say, you know, you don't trust things that are too white, like white cigarettes and cocaine and all that stuff that's white, you know, the white flour, it's, this is really bad stuff. So we should avoid, try to avoid those foods and eat more moderate, the carbohydrates we eat should be more moderately glycemic, like sweet potato and oats and whole grains and fresh fruit. But the most, but the carbohydrates that we eat the most, or the foods we eat the most of, should be foods with the lowest glycemic load foods like beans and green vegetables and squashes and, and, and berries and, uh, and mushrooms and onions. We should eat liberally in large amounts of the food with the lowest glycemic index. We don't want that glucose to be rised up in our, in our, to overeat on high glycemic load foods. But in any case, if we rate different carbohydrates based on a hierarchical score that considers its nutrient density, its fiber content, its level of protective phytochemicals, and its level of resistant starch, it's very, very important. The resistant starch is a type of carbohydrate that's resistant to enzymatic degradation, which means it turns, it doesn't get absorbed as calories. Remember I told you earlier that all the calories in nuts and seeds don't get absorbed into the bloodstream, but some of them pass out into the toilet bowl? Well, some of the calories in beans don't get broken down by the body either. They pass through you and go right through into the toilet bowl because the, res the resistant starch is degraded by bacteria in the distal part of the small intestines and proximal part of the large intestines. That means it gets turned into fat, but it gets turned into short-chain fatty acids so far down in the digestive tract that 90% of those calories pass through into the toilet bowl, thus increasing stool fat. More fat in your stool, less fat in your body. You understand that? And the 10% of those short-chain fatty acids that are made from beans that are absorbed have beneficial effects to lower the glycemic effect of other foods and have anti-cancer effects. And the buildup of bacteria that are needed to digest those resistant starches in beans have beneficial health effects. Those bacteria prevent the absorption of glucose from other foods that are not beans. Let me say that one more time. When you're a regular bean eater, are you following this? When you eat beans regularly, you build up the bacteria to digest those beans better. So when you're eating beans regularly, you're not producing as much gas from the beans as anymore because you're digesting them better because you're eating them regularly. So you lose the fun of producing the gas, but <laughs> you have now a bowel full of those bean digesting bacteria. And those bean digesting bacteria live within you now. And then when you eat enough the next meal and you have oatmeal and berries and something, when you eat another meal, those bean bacteria are still in you. And those bacteria that, that grew from the eating of beans had this, the effect to have the effect to slow the glucose absorption. They have an anti-glycemic effect. They lower the absorption of glucose from other foods that are not beans, even in the second meal or the third meal. It's called the scientific literature. Scientists, scientists call this the second meal effect. But it's not really the second meal effect because it happens at the third, fourth, fifth meal, any meal you eat if you're eating beans regularly. Are you following this now? So I'm rating carbohydrates on a hierarchical scale to emphasize that if we look at fiber, nutrient density, resistant starch, slowly absorption of nutrients, that the beans and peas are at the top of that hierarchical scale because those have the most anti-diabetic, weight loss beneficial, and even anti-cancer benefits because of the way they're digested.